go this conference will now be recorded. Our agenda today, uh, first I will give a quick introduction about Strat Oil Services, and, and then I will give the floor to Dr. Jean to start uh, the, his technical presentation. Please ensure that you mute your mic, close your camera, and if you need to ask any question, uh, please type in the chat window and Dr. John will answer all the questions. Uh, but before starting. Let's take a moment of safety due to COVID-19 uh, and returning back to work will have to wear the face mask all day long. So if you need to eat or drink anything and you have to remove your mask, please remove it completely to prevent infection by bacteria or virus. And stay safe. Uh, today I will talk about Strat Oil Energy Services, uh, our disciplines and their delivering solutions, uh, SES track record and achievements, and our client, uh, training offering and statistics, uh, public initiatives, our partners, uh, then we'll start the technical presentation by Dr. Jean. Uh, finally, we'll start our discussion, questions and answers. Strat Oil, it is an oil field uh, service company which is based in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, we offer uh, unique technical and non-technical solutions to uh, the Egyptian oil and gas market uh, by providing uh, training and consultancy with very high quality and competitive prices. Our disciplines, we work in exploration to drilling, reservoir engineering and well integrity. Uh, training courses, we provide technical training and non-technical training. Please mute your mic. Thank you. We provide technical training and non-technical training for the managerial department. Uh, also, we provide consultancy through far distance support, uh, which where we take your data and work uh, on it remotely, then come back to you with the results. Uh, the on-site support, our consultants come to your premises and work with your team to get out with the best results. Uh, our new technology, we offer software solutions through our partners uh, outside Egypt. Uh, also, Consultar, it is uh, our main product and will be launched very soon. Uh, we executed uh, 24 workshops, trained 265 trainees, and our field trips, we executed four field trips in the Western Desert, Gulf of Suez, Sinai. Uh, we came back with 96.65% positive, uh, percent, uh, uh, percent positive evaluation feedback. Also, we cooperated with 14 clients. Our uh, training venues, we executed seven in-house workshops, uh, seven workshops in Hurghada, and two workshops in Sharm el Sheikh, two workshops in Cairo uh, hotels, and uh, four workshops were held in our premises. This is a list of our clients. We uh, cooperated with Petrobel, Agiba, Babitco, Rashpetko, Wintershell, Dea, Suku, Karun, GPC, Ganub, Norobetko. Uh, our instructors are national and international. Uh, most of them are PhD holders and have 20 to 30 years of practical and academic experience. Uh, we, cooperating, we are cooperating with Heritwat University, Stanford University, uh, uh, Cairo University, Oklahoma to provide instructors uh, from there. Also, the non-technical uh, instructors, we provide instructors working in the American Chamber of Commerce in Egypt and the American University in Cairo. These are uh, some of the, of the photos from our events uh, in Hurghada and the field trips and in-house courses. Our social initiative, we uh, started our graduation project coaching program. Uh, this was made for um, the senior level uh, students in the universities. Also, we uh, uh, executed our effective, effective management uh, course for GV training managers. This was the first non-technical learning nugget and it was held at our premises for the training managers. Uh, finally, we will move to our partners. Uh, we have uh, Wetki, they are specialized in the well-testing knowledge. 
uh, also APPS. They are specialized in the GNG training and consultancy. Uh, Badly Ashton, they are uh, from the top notch in, uh, in the world in uh, borehole imaging and sedimentology field studies. Uh, Badly GE Science, we are their exclusive agent here in Egypt, providing their software solutions and consultancy. Uh, they are specialized in uh, the fault seal and fracture analysis. Uh, finally, Lamina, we are their main uh, agent here in Egypt. And uh, Dr. Jean, you can uh, uh, take it from here. Dr. Jean, can you hear me? Thank you. It'll take us just a moment. Okay, perfect. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, you yeah. do. All right, and please mute if you're not. Um... So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, well, afternoon here, I guess it's evening there. Uh, I'm John Castagna. I'm director of Illumina Technology. I'm a professor at the University of Houston. And my presentation today is on quantitative seismic analysis for reservoir and prospect optimization. And let's see if I can advance. There we go. Uh, first, a few words about my company, Illumina Technologies. Uh, we are a software and services company, and our specialty is quantitative seismic analysis. Uh, can you please mute if you're not speaking? Thank you. Uh, we are an industry leader in spectral decomposition uh, and with extension of seismic data, high resolution amplitude versus offset analysis and seismic conversion. Uh, very unique seismic attribute. Uh, conditioning and rock properties prediction. Uh, we have unique capabilities, uh, many actually, but the uh, most significant ones are phase decomposition, which I'll tell you about today. Uh, fault attribute and reflectivity decomposition. Uh, we have, uh, have people in Houston, in Beijing, in Formosa, and we also have affiliates in like right off the worldwide. Most of our capabilities that I'll discuss today are in a software package called QI, and that and a variety of plugins are offered by Halliburton. So let me be, begin. Uh, there's an old axiom that says uh, garbage in, garbage out. So we pay a lot of attention to the data coming in, including in amplitude and phase, control, direction, et cetera. But noise suppression, especially when we're working pre-stack, has been a major, uh, very important endeavor for us. And one of our best accomplishments in terms of noise suppression has been our uh, adaptive multiple removal. Uh, in particular, um, of all the techniques I've seen for removing in intra-bed multiples, very short period multiples, um, this adaptive multiple uh, removal uh, seems to work the best. Um, we will invert surface, peg leg, and short period intra-bed multiples. And that's critical, especially when you have low reflectivity with strong multiples. It, it interferes with your ability to be um, quantitative. Just to show you an example of our pre stack routers, uh, with offset improvements in the and normal move out correctly. So you see our primaries are flat. And let me just make sure that everybody can see my pointer. So the primaries are flat. And the events that are not flat are either improper move out, for example, due to anisotropy here, or multiples. 
So the key is we want to preserve the primaries, even the ones without perfect move out. Uh, and we want to remove the multiples, which you can see are very significant source of noise. So this is uh, what our radon transfer is. Uh, by the way, does everybody else hear a lot of noise? Is everybody muted? I'm hearing a lot of side noise. Um, okay. Um, not sure what to do about that. All right. So here's, here's an example of our radar multiple. Um, and uh, it's done a decent job of uh, removing some of the, the very obviously wrong move outs. Our radon is uh, different from what uh, is usually performed in the industry in that it is uh, the parameters are time, space, and offset varying. We could be very surgical about removing things, but obviously that's inadequate. Um, if you look at the energy that's removed, you can see that uh, it's not primary energy. Uh, it's, uh, it's clearly uh, multiples, but we haven't uh, we haven't taken care of everything we need to. Here are the normal move out corrected uh, gathers. Uh, so now we have perfect move out essentially on our primaries. But I think you can see in near offsets here, there are these bright amplitudes, and most of these are due to interbed multiples, which have very similar move out to primary. So uh, they will not be uh, suppressed by conventional uh, techniques. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I'm going to have to mute uh, Toto Kuto. Uh, I'm not sure how to do that manually because I, I don't see on my screen the way to do that at the moment. So if he could mute, uh, a lot of noise was coming from there. Thank you. All right, so um, these uh, intrabed multiples have the same move out as the primary. So standard multiple suppression won't get them. So uh, what we have to do is we have to uh, invert uh, the data, including the effect of, of intrabed multiples. We have to distinguish between the primaries and multiples. Uh, so we take those modeled multiples and we adaptively subtract them from the data. And this is the result we get. So um, you can see it would make quite a difference on the amplitude variation with offset, and it will also affect the stack significantly. So here's an example of stack data before and after the multiple suppression. I think you could see a very wormy character in the original data. Uh, but most importantly, in some of these transparent zones, underneath strong reflectivity above, you get what appear to be events that, in fact, are multiples. And you see that they've been removed, and you actually have what look like false events within the transparent zone after the multiples are removed. You have better coherency and a better uh, tie to the logs. This has a great effect on the ABO analysis. So um, on the top, we have original ABO attributes, uh, ABO intercept, ABO gradient. The intercept is less affected by uh, pre-stack noise because it's almost as good as stacking, uh, but uh, not quite as good. But the ABO gradient is particularly susceptible to noise. And underneath, you could see what happens after we demultiple. It looks like we've laterally smoothed the data. And in fact, there has been no lateral smoothing. This demultiple is a trace by trace process. Um, and you could see much better coherency on the gradient. And if you look in detail, you could see uh, a very different interpretation. Another thing we're known for at Lumina is uh, spectral decomposition. Uh, we offer a variety of different types of spectral decomposition. Uh, the Traditional techniques, the Fourier and the continuous wavelet transform, either have window problems or serious resolution problems at low frequencies. Uh, we offer some uh, high-end spectral decomposition techniques that have uh, excellent resolution, uh, 
uh, in both uh, the time space and frequency space at all frequencies. So here's an example of a, uh, an amplitude map, and there's a channelized system in here, but you see a strong acquisition footprint, and it's hard to define the channel precisely. Uh, this is the image at 25 hertz. You notice that a lot of the footprint is gone. There still is some striping, but the really serious stuff is gone. And also, we seem to have isolated the main channel better. And of course, with spectral decomposition, you could do RGB overlays to color blend different frequencies and maximize the image. And, and so here, we've isolated the channel extremely well. Uh, lots of applications of spectral decomposition, including uh, uh, direct hydrocarbon indication. And this is something that uh, many in the industry have not really caught up to, even though we've been doing this now for about 20 years. Here's an example from Mexico, where the uh, white traces are uh, the original broadband data. And underneath, uh, the colors represent the energy at given frequencies. This First image is at six hertz. So this is the brighter the color, uh, the stronger the energy at six hertz, hertz. And so I'll call your attention to this event here that seems to be deficient in high frequencies updip, but rich in low frequencies. I'm sorry, deficient in low frequencies updip, but rich in low frequencies downdip. Uh, we now go to 40 hertz, and if it will advance. There we go. And we have a very different picture. We have a beautiful amplitude anomaly at 40 hertz, which if I could show you the map, you would see this amplitude follows structural contours very well. Uh, this was uh, an upthrown three-way closure. Uh, so there's a fault trap here. Three-way closure against the fault, a beautiful amplitude anomaly, and this was drilled and this was pegged. Also, with spectral decomposition, we could do a much better job of detecting uh, faults. Uh, typically, we operate, uh, we use fault attributes on the broadband data um, using things like curvature, coherency, variance, et cetera. Uh, but faults show up better at different frequencies. So given a fault of a given throw, there are certain frequencies where it will show up best. So what we do is uh, we do spectral decomposition first. We break up the data into a number of frequency bands. Then uh, compute a variety of discontinuity attributes, including looking at the change in phase uh, spatially. And we do principal component on all of these attributes, including chaos, semblance, curvature, variance, just what, uh, whatever you uh, a, a variety of different attributes. The principal component analysis pulls out the most significant information uh, and coherent information contained in those attributes. And we combine the form to produce a fault detection attribute. So here's an example in the US. Uh, there's a big strike slip fault in the middle of the section here. Um, you don't see it. I've often run into this problem where the geologists are telling me, we know there's a strike slip fault, and I don't see it on seismic uh, because the offset, the vertical offset is not very great. It's not that noticeable on seismic. Um, but the geologist shows me the surface geology map, and there's no question that there's a strike slip fault there. In fact, in this section, there's a flower structure that you don't see. Uh, if you look at curvature, uh, it doesn't show up very well. Coherence, you're starting to uh, see something going on here in the middle. And with our fault detection attribute, and then you have a beautiful flower structure there. And you start seeing fault patterns that look uh, very much like looking at the side of an outcrop. If you go to a cliff face uh, and, and see the way the faults vertically um, act, uh, this looks very realistic here. Um, also, being able to look at coherency attributes in section view, this is this is a vertical section. Most you usually don't look at coherency in vertical section. It's usually in time slice view. Uh, for example, uh, this might make what looks like a beautiful time slice, the curvature, but in vertical section view, it's really hard to track what a fault is doing vertically. Whereas with our attribute. 
we could see beautifully without doing and tracking. You could always and track on this and get uh, really amazing results. But uh, these are the actual discontinuities in the data. So um, uh, it, it turns out to allow you to see if there's vertical communication, for example, in unconventional reservoirs, the vertical extent of the fault is very important. And once we have an excellent uh, discontinuity cube, uh, we could then compute fault attributes, such as fault break and dip, or we could count faults, number of faults. We could also measure fault displacement uh, very perfectly, um, automatically. So here we have a, a chair section where we have the vertical slices where the, uh, the strike is displayed as an attribute, and that's a useful thing. On a vertical slice, you see a fault, you don't know which way it's striking. That really helps your interpretation to be able to look at a vertical slice and see the strike uh, striping. Uh, in, in time slice view, we could look at the discontinuity attribute itself, or we could look at the dip, and that's useful in time slice view. Often you see a discontinuity in time slice, you don't know which direction the fault is dipping. And also we can see the displacement. So that shows up the, um, the most significant faults and allows you to interpret uh, faults better. You can see how throws add, et cetera. Another thing we could do is count the uh, faults, the discontinuity. So we can produce a fault density and we could compute rows diagram showing the, uh, basically a histogram, the number of faults as a function of asthma. And that uh, is certainly useful in uh, understanding the local state of stress. Okay, moving on beyond spectral decomposition, uh, where we decompose a, a seismic trace into many frequencies. So one trace in, many traces out. Uh, we could do what is called phase decomposition, uh, where we decompose the data into many phases. So here we have a, this wiggle here is a seismic trace. And here the amplitudes have been spread over the phases of the events producing uh, those amplitudes. So if we sum across all these phases, uh, we will then reproduce the seismic trace uh, perfectly. So instead of a time frequency analysis, like a spectral decomposition is, this is a time phase analysis. So uh, unlike phase attributes or phase rotations, we can actually map the amplitude associated with a given phase. And this has tremendous implications in uh, direct hydrocarbon indication uh, and stratigraphic analysis. So, uh, Amazingly, this phase decomposition can show uh, very anomalous behavior at given at particular phases. So for example, here we have a synthetic section where there's a channel in the middle and you don't see a big change in the response. Uh, it looks uh, essentially zero phase. In fact, there has been a slight change in phase in the channel because it's got different rock properties than the interchannel area. And so if we look at the minus 90 degree phase attribute or phase component in this case, on that phase component, the amplitude is extremely anomalous. So uh, this gives us the ability uh, to see features, uh, geological features that we otherwise would not have seen. It also turns out that the effect of hydrocarbons in a thin layer is always to uh, that effect always occurs in the minus 90 degree, degree component in most cases, in some cases on the positive 90 degree components if you're in a dim spot type of situation. Uh, so this is also, uh, the, gives you the, the ability to see an, uh, amplitude anomalies caused by hydrocarbons that you otherwise would not have seen. So here's a, a synthetic example of an ABO case. This is uh, the famous Hampson Russell colony sand 3D up in Canada. And it was a channel sand with hydrocarbons in it. This is just a synthetic from that data set just to show what phase decomposition does. So here's our original full synthetic. 
here is the minus 90 degree phase component, and you can see a huge amplitude anomaly at uh, far offsets, whereas previously the AVO was kind of subtle. Uh, also, you see anomalous, uh, very different behavior near and far offset on the plus 90 degree phase component. So again, uh, phase decomposition can make turn subtle anomalies into very strong obvious anomalies. Uh, more so, it can re remove the ambiguity in AVO analysis that uh, happens uh, uh, because of the, the trade-off between the Poisson's ratio and the apparent move-out of the events. So here's a case, it's synthetic data, so we know the move-out is absolutely correct. So this is a synthetic NMO-corrected gather. This is uh, brine sand, and uh, you can see the brine sand is absolutely uh, flat, has an amplitude decrease with offset. We'll now look at the gas sand synthetic with the correct NMO correction, because we know the velocity. There's your gas sand, and it looks like the velocity has not been corrected properly. So if you had a very zealous uh, interpreter who was being very careful about flattening all its events, he would essentially remove this AVO anomaly. In fact, the AVO anomaly is primarily seen as a change of phase of the event from near to far offset. And, uh, and you can see an amplitude uh, polarity reversal here as we're going at the top here, we're going from positive to negative. So uh, all very ambiguous and you're relying on your processor to do things right. But now I'm gonna look at the zero phase component of this synthetic. You notice the zero phase component has the correct move out. Um, take we don't do any more move out correction. We take this thing, we do phase decomposition, and we have the correct move out. That shows that the move out was done properly. And in fact, uh, the move out, if you want to do velocity analysis, it should be done on uh, a constant phase component in order to get uh, the velocity right. If the phase is changing with offset due to rock properties changes, changes your velocity analysis is going to be wrong. We could also look at the minus 90 degree component, and here we have a big amplitude increase at far offset. So something that was a subtle anomaly that might have been destroyed by move out correction now is a screaming amplitude anomaly. So very good for hydrocarbon detection. Uh, so going back to that cap, a channel sand example, and we published this, this is in uh, geophysics. Um, uh, we look at the, this channel sand on the full stack data, and I gave this, ex talked about this example for 20 years in my ABL classes, and I always thought this was a structural high, or at least a stratigraphic high, maybe differential compaction around a channel or something. Uh, but in fact, you can see the, the events underneath are flat. So this is actually a polarity reversal caused by the hydrocarbons. It, it causes this apparent uh, structural high, but it is a polarity reversal. Um, so here is the near stack, the far stack. They all are showing that same uh, bulge at top, which is not real. Um, if you look on uh, the minus 90 degree component, uh, it isolates the hydrocarbons. As I said, the hydrocarbon effect is minus 90 degrees. Now, there are other things that are going to be minus 90 degrees as well, other combinations of impedance. That's fine. But the change from brine to hydrocarbons, that change is in always, for thin layers, always in the minus 90 degree component. So there it is, and it shows up beautifully at far offsets. And if you look at the uh, uh, plus 90 degree component, you can see a dim spot here, also a hard streak in there, which wasn't apparent that it was a hard streak. It might have been a second pace in, but in fact, it's not. That's carbonate cemented there. All right, now moving on to get more quantitative, we want to do inversion. And there are basically two ways to do inversion. Uh, one is a, a subjective technique where you impose your bias on the result. That is, you create a starting model from well logs and you invert from there. And that has a nasty habit of uh, 
confirming your biases. Uh, it's really not a very good way to look at what the seismic data is trying to tell you. It's really telling you if you're, the seismic data will allow your interpretation. Uh, a more objective way to do things is sparse spike inversion, but that is also, it's been around for about 40 years. It's not very popular. Um, and the reason is it's a very noisy and inadequate type of uh, inversion. And uh, we've addressed the inadequacy um, with a new uh, way to parameterize the sparse spike inversion. Um, the reasons I don't like sparse spike inversion, number one, it's biased against thin layers, and, and we show that in a paper in geophysics, and we show how to defeat that. Uh, it's laterally unstable and non-geological. Uh, there are lots of artifacts and lots of non-geological looking variations laterally. And also, uh, weak reflection coefficients are poorly regularized, and uh, we show that in a paper that was uh, recently accepted in geophysics. So the way to, to defeat this problem is to look at inversion also as a decomposition of a trace, where now the trace, instead of being decomposed into frequencies or phases, is decomposed into reflection events. So these are isolated interfaces uh, with a wavelet bouncing off of each one, these sum to form the seismic trace. Uh, and uh, the problem with this uh, is that uh, when you have thin layers, uh, sparse spike inversion will get very confused. Uh, so these actually won't be, uh, are not single interfaces. And the sparse spike inversion doesn't really handle that very well. Instead, we decompose into, in a different way, instead of uh, decomposing the seismic trace into a system of isolated interfaces, we can decompose into a summation of layer responses. These layer responses, we've made no assumption about the thickness of these layers. So the sparsity constraint does not bias against layer thickness uh, when we invert the right way. And this is just a comparison of, uh, uh, this is a, again, a 3D in Canada. This was the sparse spike inversion. Uh, you can see it's very blocky. It jumps around. It looks very noisy. It doesn't resolve the layers very well, uh, as opposed to a sparse layer inversion, which is uh, not only higher resolution, but less noisy. That's, that's usually, we, we try to increase the resolution. We increase the noise. But by parameterizing things properly, we increase the resolution and produce something which, again, looks like it's laterally smooth, but it's not. It's a trace-by-trace -trace operation. And you also see we're resolving things that previously uh, were not being resolved. In particular, there are channel sands in here uh, that are prospective that we're able to resolve. And I think we're breaking out some of these coal layers, like that one there. That coal is uh, being broken out much better. Um, this was, uh, was the Hampson Russell sparse conversion. We've also compared to the Jason, what our clients have compared to the Jason sparse spike conversion. This was in the North Sea. Uh, the target sand is the top May sand here. The Jason sparse spike conversion is jumping all over the place. Uh, our inversion is much more stable. In fact, the magnitude of the blue here is an indication of the porosity. And you see in the sparse spike inversion, uh, you, it looks like you have no porosity continuity, whereas uh, with our inversion, we're seeing porosity through most of the uh, area. Now, if we can invert for thinner layers, that means we are extending the bandwidth of the data. And if we take those inversions and uh, create a reflectivity model involved with a wavelet, we now have bandwidth extended data. So without wells, without well control, uh, we can increase the frequency content of the data. So here's an example in Mexico where we have uh, a number of pay sands here, um, and a number of them are resolved. You can see we, um, we're not resolving anything. You can independently map these. Um, however, we do our sparse layer inversion and convert to a bandwidth extended section. And you see uh, amazing resolution uh, with a beautiful well tie. 
confirming that what we're doing is valid. And now we have a chance to independently uh, map and evaluate at least the top two. This one, it seems like the bottom one seems to be coming and going, but maybe it really is coming and going. But anyway, previously we had no prayer of making any inferences at all. Now we have, uh, we could do independent analysis and we can work for rock properties in these individual layers. Of course, uh, Tuning and interference affect AVO attributes uh, tremendously uh, because the tuning varies with offset. Your, your time thickness of a layer uh, decreases with offset, and that could uh, suppress AVO responses that could also enhance AVO responses. Uh, so here we're uh, looking at an AVO attribute. It's a combination of uh, intercept and gradient. And red here represents a, a drop in Poisson's ratio. Blue represents an increase in Poisson's ratio. We know that uh, light hydrocarbons will drop the Poisson's ratio in the layer. So what we're looking at is red over blue. Red would be the top of the, the pay. Blue would be the bottom of the pay. Here was the conventional ABO, and this was a well shell drilled. And in fact, it was correct. They got the top. So and base down here. So they detected that pay. But now the question is, what is happening down there? Uh, does the pay extend all the way down to here, or might there be a contact someplace? And what is happening down here in the mini basin? Very often there's pay in the mini basin, and it's, it's all confused over here. In fact, when we do ultra pre-stack with better resolution, now we see a very uh, good stratigraphic picture. We're seeing uh, the pay that was discovered. We also see a termination of that, which happens to correspond to the original uh, water contact. We now go down dip of the water contact, which is a risky thing to do, but you have sands that are pinching out up dip. I think that's very clear here. So these all suddenly became very prospective, and these were all drilled and these were all pay. So here's a beautiful example of the way resolution can produce very misleading ABO results. Again, we're looking for red over blue, a uh, drop in Poisson's ratio with an increase in Poisson's ratio underneath. And we have a number of wells with pay and right where the ABO says it should be. We have red over blue, red over blue, red over blue. So this whole area, highly perspective. Then you have a dry hole with no sand at all. And now you have an AVO anomaly over here, but there's a problem. It's blue over red. That suggests that this layer is an abnormally high Poisson's ratio. So uh, if the client had asked me uh, my uh, feelings about this prospect, I would say AVO is negative here. AVO is not telling me to drill this. Uh, but I would have been wrong because I was looking at limited resolution. If I increase the resolution with our uh, ultra product, uh, again, we have all the pay over here showing up. Now we're seeing at the prospect location that there was a hard unit above the prospect, but at the same stratigraphic level as the pay, I now have nice red over blue at that level. So it was these hard units, it, a blue over red and another blue, it was this above that caused apparently the wrong, what we call ABO polarity. So you need, the better your resolution, uh, the better your ABO analysis is gonna be. Of course, then if we're predicting rock properties uh, using machine learning, uh, this happened to be done using a simple neural networks in the old Hampson Russell Emerge uh, program. Uh, but uh, we're comparing the result with the original seismic data and the result um, after our bandwidth extension. And this is the well log smooth to the uh, frequency of the prediction. And you can see we're doing just a fabulous job of predicting porosity with high resolution and all our statistical measures uh, improved, including our statistical significance, when we use the, the uh, bandwidth extended data coming in. Nowadays, we're using more sophisticated uh, machine learning, but we found that more important than the, the particular 
type of neural network you're using is the data coming in. And bringing in spectral decomposition, high resolution uh, bandwidth, uh, bandwidth extended data, and other novel attributes that we've developed greatly improve our rock properties prediction. Now, I mentioned that sparse spike inversion does a bad job of inverting for small reflection coefficients. So here's a synthetic case, so it's hard to argue with this, where we have some large reflection coefficients and some small ones in the vicinity of the large ones. So the uh, responses are interfering with each other. These small ones are being swamped in the synthetic. And when we do a sparse spike inversion, you see uh, in this case, it's synthetic, so we should be able to do a good job. Well, we've done a fine job on the big reflection coefficients, but a terrible job on the small reflection coefficients. And that's because sparse spike inversion is dominated by the big reflection coefficients. The sparsity constraint is the L1 norm of the reflectivity, and that's going to be dominated by big reflections. Sparse spike conversion doesn't pay too much attention to these weak reflections. So the way uh, uh, a way to fix this is to do a better job of applying your sparsity constraint. Instead of applying your sparsity constraint to the original trace, we can invert for reflectivity produce the trace that resulted from the, the strong reflectivity, and then look at the residual, which is what's left, the, uh, what the re weak reflection coefficients produce. We can now run a sparse inversion on the weak reflectivity, and these are the reflection coefficients we get. We compare that to the true weak reflection coefficients, and you see we've done an amazing job in this case, you say, well, it's synthetic data, it's easy, but look at sparse spike conversion. Sparse spike conversion got it totally wrong. So with, now we're, so we're decomposing the data by the magnitude of the reflectivity. And uh, we could use the magnitude, we could also use the vertical su succession of reflection coefficients to pull out particular patterns. We call this reflectivity decomposition, and this paper was just accepted in geophysics. Here's an example uh, going after carbonate porosity. So this is in the Permian Basin of the US, the Midland Subbasin. And here we have wells that have been blocked according to the different layers, but where you see more blocking nature, that's more porosity. Some wells have low porosity, right? So we have low porosity here and here and we have high porosity in some of these other wells. From the seismic data, infer the porosity. I challenge you to look at those wiggles and decide for yourself where the porosity is. It's, it's quite hard to do to come up with a rule just looking at these composite waveforms that will work in all situations. Instead, we do reflectivity decomposition, and again, these are, this is our uh, reflectivity, our weak reflectivity due to the porosity variations. We've removed the event above and the event below, and we see this reflectivity associated with porosity. Now you notice where there is good porosity, we have high amplitudes. Where we have low porosity, we have poor amplitudes. So uh, we now have an attribute that can be directly related to porosity. So we could produce, for example, an amplitude map. Uh, on the original data, it doesn't show any correspondence to the wells. Uh, now, here the purple are these high porosity pods in the carbonate. So very discontinuous, but this tells you where the sweet spots would be in your reservoir, something you could never interpret from the original amplitudes. So how well do, does this work? I mean, how well is this a porosity attribute working? Well, we can cross plot. We could look at the relative amplitude from the original data versus the porosity uh, times thickness, the porosity feet uh, in the wells. And on the original seismic, it was just a scatter. There was no relationship. Uh, after the reflectivity decomp had an absolute beautiful relationship. Keep in mind, we haven't used the well information in any way. So this is a very strong verification of the technique. 
So I've uh, run through a lot of material very fast, but I wanted to give you an overview of the kinds of things we can do. And I'm happy to entertain any questions at this point. And I'm gonna go to the chat and see if you, uh, it would probably be easiest if you just send your uh, question as a chat message. So uh, we can wait for a few minutes and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or you can ask the questions verbally if you have any. Oh, yes, okay. So, um, okay, so number one, uh, there is a question, is there any confidence matrix on the inversion? And, and it depends what type of inversion you're talking about in terms of confidence, uh, you know, by definition, the inversion is going to match the seismic trace. So if we're doing an impedance inversion, we by definition are matching the seismic trace. On the other hand, if it's a properties inversion and we compare it to well information or if we're comparing, comparing impedance to well information, uh, then we can get a measure of the confidence. So we always like to validate at wells and when we validate at wells, uh, that will give us a standard deviation, uh, it will give us an average error, and it will give us an F statistic. So if there is well information where either we're predicting a rock property like porosity or predicting an inverted impedance, uh, from there uh, we can measure the uh, inversion, the confidence, and we could also con con you know, produce a confusion matrix as well if there are uh, competing solutions. So we saw another question. Uh, we saw products of Hamps and Russell many times. Uh, can Lumina achieve the same? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we, we like the Hamps and Russell software for the way it uh, displays the data. And um, when we first started as a company, we were a service company and we started exclusively using Hamps and Russell software. Uh, our QI package uh, does all of these uh, same things now. Also, many of these, the, the, uh, much of the data that I was, the examples that I was able to present were done by my students at the university who, uh, of course, all use uh, Hampson Russell software as well. It's a good training for them. So um, anyway, the answer is yes. Um, there may be some capabilities in Hampson Russell we don't have, but everything that we can significant is in the QI product. I have a question from a, a, an old friend of mine. Uh, from your experience, what are the best practices to delineate and characterize fractures in carbonates? So of course, uh, from Ahmed Hafez, I would get a difficult question. Fractures in carbonate are tough. Uh, fractures every place are tough. We try to use uh, multi-azimuthal data. If you have aligned fractures, uh, we look at the various kinds of anisotropy. One thing that's novel that we do, I didn't show it here, but looking at azimuthal spectral decomposition uh, shows very subtle changes in layer thickness that otherwise would not be seen on a gross estimate like uh, velocity, for example. Uh, so looking at azimuthal uh, peak frequency and attributes like that, we have found to be very associated with fractures. Of course, this assumes the fractures are very well aligned. And if there are any follow-up on these questions, I, I'll be happy to look at those. Okay, another question. What are the machine learning algorithms implemented in Lumina? I have to say, well, we, we've implemented many different types of uh, neural networks, you know, uh, very, many different architectures. Uh, I couldn't even begin to enumerate all, all the ones. I mean, uh, I kind of like the convolutional neural networks, but, um, but we've used different types. And in my experience, the particular type of algorithm you use 
is secondary to setting up the problem right and having the data condition right such that you give the algorithm uh, a fighting chance. A perfect example of this is uh, suppose we give an amplitude attribute to a neural, neural network and it's trying to predict porosity using amplitude at a given layer. Um, well, what about everything happening above the reservoir? What about changes in the overburden? What, what about changes in attenuation? Um, the neural network in interpreting that amplitude in terms of rock properties at the layer that doesn't have a chance of uh, comprehending that many of the amplitude changes have nothing to do with porosity. So designing your attributes so as to self-compensate for many of these common mistakes uh, give the learning algorithm a, a better chance of solving the problem. Uh, another question, any improvements about extended elastic uh, inversion for lithology prediction? So this is uh, following up on Colony and Whitmore, some uh, very uh, brilliant mathematics uh, that they did and uh, basically uh, creating new attributes in which uh, various uh, rotations of trends uh, can be interpreted in terms of lithology and porosity. And, uh, you know, from my point of view, uh, there are other ways to do the same thing. And so we've not taken the route of extended elastic inversion very much, uh, although we do provide that capability. Uh, but uh, I personally feel that, uh, that it, there are additional uh, assumptions that must be made and uh, to do that. And I haven't... Uh, it's always made me uncomfortable. Like, for example, they have this K factor that must be assumed to be constant and so forth. There are other assumptions that are made too. So I prefer to just deal with the, uh, with the data and uh, be more deterministic in what we do. Okay. Um, favorite seismic attributes and seismic inversions in the exploration stage. Well, well that's great. Uh, and regardless of seismic quality, Okay, so, wow, what an open-ended question this is. So, uh, you know, the more, uh, sometimes the more powerful an attribute it is, the more sensitive it is to noise. So, uh, you know, pre-stack uh, attributes, ABO attributes, pre-stack inversion is sensitive to noise and uh, also sensitive to poor imaging as can phase decomposition be. Phase, you know, phase decomposition can be robust if you're dealing with bright spots and if you're dealing with strong signal noise ratio, but to show some of the very fine uh, anomalous behavior that I showed you, uh, signal noise ratio starts to become an issue. Uh, so, um, you know, the more sophisticated you get, uh, the more you have to worry about the noise. Uh, as far as which attribute I would use if I had very, very noisy data, my answer would be I would have to look at the data first, and I would have to see the type of anomaly I'm looking for. Uh, phase attributes tend to be very robust. Uh, there may be types of amplitudes that uh, may be more ro robust as well, especially if I normalize properly. So, for example, things like amplitude over background over RMS windows and things like that uh, can be more robust than the uh, more precise attributes that we deal with. Uh, okay, what are the application uh, for, I presume, phase decomposition for wave incidents more than 30 degrees? It, it, um, we're talking about phase decomposition here. This is a question from Zubir. Um, you know, be, when you start getting to very wide angles and uh, the reflection coefficients become complex and you get phase changes as well as amplitude changes. So there's potentially an application for phase decomposition at these very wide angles to use these changes of phase with angle uh, directly as a rock properties indicator. But that is uh, a little bit pie in the sky in the sense that I haven't done that yet. But theoretically, uh, that should be possible. Um, okay. Uh, also, you know, generally, 
in AVO analysis, when we use AVO attributes, uh, beyond 30 degrees, the intercept and gradient alone are not sufficient. So what we have to do is we have to limit the data to the attributes to 30 degrees. We start going beyond 30 degrees and we have to start adding more terms, maybe a third term. And theoretically, there's the possibility to extract density uh, as we get out to these very wide angles. Uh, that I've seen very mixed success in doing that. Again, signal to noise ratio seems to be the limiting factor. Uh, typically, the, the wider the angle, the more noisy the data. And it's just an unfortunate uh, fact of life. Okay, another old friend of mine, Dave Reynolds. Uh, since errors in demultiple of velocity analysis can produce wrong results, do you have to reprocess from field data to preserve the true AVO anomalies? Um, wow. Uh, I would, you don't necessarily have to go to field data. Uh, you may be able to catch things before move out correction and before uh, uh, multiple suppression. Uh, but odds are, if, if this is legacy, uh, odds are that data won't be available and you have to reprocess from scratch. Okay, there was a question about uh, David Hale's fault likelihood attribute. What are the main differences between fault detect and fault likelihood? Um, similar in concept, uh, fault likelihood uh, is relying on how things line up vertically. Um, I, you know, we've compared our results, uh, for example, to the fault likelihood that Halliburton has and the fault probability uh, in paradigm that paradigm has. And uh, I would just say compare. Um, we like our attribute. Um, I don't. I don't want to speak badly about any other attributes. Um, I know, you know, the fault likelihood is a pretty good one. Okay. What is your recommendation pre-stack inversion or AVO for, for late development stage or both? Um, a lot of that has to do with um, how, how much time you have uh, and how quantitative you can be with the data. If I'm going to do pre-stack conversion, I want to be calibrated with wells. I want to make sure that um, uh, my amplitudes are calibrated, not calibrated and balanced, and I want to make sure that uh, my phase is correct. Uh, it, and that all takes time. That takes money. Uh, but if uh, I'm, I'm uh, in the development stage of a field, uh, I've had the time to do that. Um, so uh, I'm a big fan of pre-stack inversion under the right conditions. Um, ABO, of course, is more of a quick look, look for anomalies, look for anomalous behavior, then try to understand why and uh, be less quantitative. Although we have good, had good success using ABO attributes in machine learning, uh, surprising success in machine learning. Um, as far as the very late development stage, uh, Presumably at this point, you've got a tremendous amount of well control. Uh, so you could really constrain your inversions a great deal. Uh, use your well logs to a maximum extent if you've got good quality logs. So uh, the more well control you have, the better chance of a successful pre-stack inversion. Another question. Will the pre-stack inversion result using angle stack data produce reliable inversions? What are the advantages and disadvantages? Uh, well, if you're going to use an angle stack instead of an offset, that presumes that you calculated the angles correctly and uh, the angle ranges you've stacked over haven't produced any smearing. Uh, in most cases, I think that, you know people who are inversion experts and are aware of these issues can do a good job with uh, angle stack data. Um, so uh, the disadvantage is that every time you apply a process, you've made an assumption which uh, may or may not be correct, and that can introduce error. Okay, uh, any method of work 
workflow to improve fault edge detection on post stack data. And um, you know, again, this uh, this fault attribute that I presented using spectral decomposition principal component analysis, uh, we found that that uh, is improved over things like uh, just raw curvature or end tracking, et cetera. I find end tracking can be very unstable and very misleading. Um, so, from your experience, what are the best variety of attributes used before applying PCA for fault detection? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, the three that I will always use are curvature, and you might try different types of curvature, coherence, and uh, phase uh, discontinuity, phase Laplace. Those uh, three are my favorites. Uh, sometimes. Uh, it's a legacy situation. We'll have other attributes like chaos or variance, and, and we'll use those as well. Okay, I think we're out of time here. Uh, so um, there are some more questions. Um, I'll ask for some uh, guidance. Uh, should, should I continue answering questions? I'm going to keep going unless somebody stops me. Okay, is there any workflow that can help de-risk the fizz gas effect in AVO? Boy, I'm glad um, that question got asked. That's a great question. Um, of course, if we could reliably invert for density. So how do we do that? Uh, we need high fold, we need large offsets, the larger the offsets, wide angles, the wider the angles, the better. And we need great signal to noise ratio. If we have all of that, we could get out to, say, reliably get out to 45 degrees, uh, then we could invert for density. And the density uh, would be a strong indicator of fizz gas because uh, you would only have a very weak density anomaly in that case. Uh, there's also the fact that uh, it turns out that attenuation uh, due to uh, gas saturation is greatest at a, a, at low saturation. So there is some potential to use um, uh, attenuation data to indicate fizz gas. And uh, a colleague of mine has uh, presented a paper on this, uh, Carlos Moreno, with uh, I believe it was an OTC paper. Um, that So that's something that uh, is also conceivable. Uh, I'm not aware at this point of a sure thing way of de-risking. Um, if you've got enough well control, uh, you could look at some of these attributes, the uh, density attribute and uh, things like attenuation, and you could correlate against ex existing wells, and that could give you an idea of how well that can, can be used to de-risk. Uh, there are other uh, factors that are not purely geophysical. There are many geological factors uh, from basin modeling, looking at uh, fault seal analysis for, uh, or seal capacities and things, looking for chimneys. There are, there, there are different ways of trying to evaluate the uh, possibility of this gas in, in addition to quantitative seismic analysis. Of course, if you had many of these different attributes working at the same time, that would be uh, helpful. Okay, question, I'm working on submarine channel evolution. Which attributes would you advise, advise I use? Well, here, uh, uh, resolution is gonna be everything. Um, so the question is, are you more interested in the channel or are you in, interested in the, uh, in the deposition within the channel? If the latter, then uh, you, know, you want resolution. So I, I, the bandwidth extension is key. The spectral decomposition, uh, I, you know, can maybe I, you know, help you look at the progression over time of uh, how channels are moving and so forth. Uh, okay, another question: Are there differences on the frequency content when applying the uh, phase decomposition for a deep reservoir than a close reservoir? Yeah. So the question, does the resolution in this case depend on the depth? And the answer is yes. And for the, the interesting thing, for this minus 90 degree phase uh, component to be a hydrocarbon indicator, it must be a seismically thin layer. And so uh, ironically, uh, 
the lower frequency your data, the more chance of your reservoir being thin. Uh, so in fact, the signal noise ratio permitting, sometimes shallow, we have to uh, apply a spectral decomposition and operate at low frequencies uh, so that we're seismically thin at those low frequencies. So um, uh, that's an important consideration. All right, uh, one last one. Is there any type of seismic attribute or inversion that could help in detection of deep igneous intrusion reservoirs? And it's open fractures using <laughs> low quality stack seismic. Wow. Uh, tough, tough. Okay, so uh, if it's an igneous intrusion, I'm, I'm expecting it to be higher impedance than uh, the material it's intruded into. If that's the case, uh, maybe phase decomposition. Uh, or we're just looking at positive amplitudes. If it's a positive event, the strongest positive amplitudes. Um, I've seen uh, coherency attributes. Uh, very often, the internally with intrusion, you'll have incoherent reflectors. So uh, the uh, the lack of coherency could be an indicator of a. Uh, of the igneous intrusion. Of course, with low quality uh, seismic data, you, know, you always have to ask the question, is that, is that noise or, or is it a uh, lack of signal? Um, but uh, yeah, I would look for something that's high impedance, so a strong positive reflection, and I would look for uh, lack of continuity within the body. Uh, as far as open fractures, open fractures and deep igneous, uh, good luck. <laughs> um, maybe as a methyl, but unlikely because of all the other complications due to the nature of the igneous body. If, if it's deep, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that as a methyl is going to work. Okay, so uh, that's that. I thank you all for uh, tolerating my lecture and uh, uh, thanks to our uh, partner, uh, Stradol. Thank you, Dr. John. Thanks, everyone, for attending this webinar. Uh, please, if you would like to know more about uh, Lumina software in Egypt, please reach uh, Strat Oil Energy Services or uh, Lumina.